So I'm recently back from the Winter NAMM show in Southern California. Last week I shared the four wackiest, coolest musical innovations from the show. And, you know, of course I learned all kinds of other surprising things. Uh, for example, Gibson and Fender don't even need to show up at NAMM to sell massive quantities of guitars. Taylor can show up with no guitars, just a meeting room, and they can also keep thriving. But there are lots of other companies that did pay the price and make the effort. So stick around to find out who they were and how they stacked up in my search for a Holy Grail acoustic guitar. Finally, before I go, I'm gonna share the three most important things I learned at this year's show. So I go to NAMM to see the latest, greatest music technology. But guitars are really my true passion. So without Gibson and Fender and Taylor, what else is there? Well, you know, which companies did come to NAMM? So I'm gonna start with Ibanez. Their booth and product line is always impressive. It's especially impressive in the electric world. And they really do keep gaining dominance among virtuosos and shredders. That being said, their acoustics really don't do much for me. Now, ESP's booth features electric brands that also appeal to, you know, rock gods and metalheads and shredders, and they had this premium showroom style booth that included a room of Takamini acoustics. Only one problem, you couldn't audition any of the guitars. They had plastic ties around the headstocks. If I can't play them, I can't judge them. You know, same was true for the Rickenbacker booth. You know, it's all look but don't touch. So in contrast, one company that really does NAM right is Yamaha. They had a huge, beautiful booth, the top floor of the convention center. It's away from the noisy exhibit hall. And they showed off all their innovations from band instruments to silent and transacoustic pianos. And they have an astoundingly consistent and excellent range of guitars, right? Electric and acoustic. They're very high quality and some shockingly low price points. So the Revstar Electrics, really impressive. They're great players, very versatile tone. And Yamaha Acoustics just get better and better every year. So FG9s are the new flagship models. These are hand-built in Japan. They retail for around 4,000. I really like them, especially the mahogany version, and I think they stack up nicely against US-made Martins at about the same price point. But it's really Yamaha's lower-end models that just defy logic for me. So this A1M retails for under 600, but it sounds and plays like something that easily costs three or four times more. Same thing with the LL16 ARE. It has an aged top, retails for about 900. It's a wow at that price. I mean, my hat is really off to Yamaha. I only wish they gave their guitar models names instead of weird and hard to remember numbers. Now, speaking of guitars, today you're helping me celebrate a big milestone. Over 200 videos on my channel and at guitardiscoveries.com. So that means guitars, tips, accessories, songwriting, performing, recording, and my Blow Up the Song series, where we discover the history of great songs and recordings, and we listen to the original multi-track masters. So please take a moment, like, subscribe, and hit the bell. All right, no matter what I might tell myself, my ulterior motive for coming to NAMM is always to play a bunch of acoustic guitars and see if I can find my own personal holy grail. Now, last year, I did get really close. I fell in love with a so-called banjo killer from Bourgeois Guitars. They're handcrafted in Maine, actually signed by legendary luthier Dana Bourgeois. I mean, this banjo killer really stood out, and it had a high but not astronomical price tag of about 6000 bucks. But it wasn't even for sale because it was committed to a guitar store in Arkansas. Now, this year, one year later, the same model banjo killer is up 33% in price to over 9000 bucks. So that is short supply and high demand in action. Now for me, the price tag of a true Holy Grail acoustic, it really has to be under 10,000. I mean, preferably way under. And that price, like a lower price, is part of what makes it a Holy Grail, right? So I always visit the CF Martin booth with high hopes because I own a historic Martin from 1889. It's actually my favorite nylon string guitar of all time. Mm -hmm. I'm 
also well acquainted with a friend's kind of holy grail Martin from the modern era. It's a Mark Knopfler signature MK40HD. Came out in the early 2000s. Today they go for over 10K if and when you can find one. So this year's Martin booth, as always, it showed off high build quality and tone, but I didn't find any knockouts at the right price, at least for me. So there was this beautiful looking and sounding Klaus Vormann D28, but it was over 18,000 bucks. Rich Robinson of the Black Crows has a relict D28 model. It's based on his vintage 54. It played and sounded great for about 7,000, but you know, do I want a relict acoustic at that price? I mean, that's, it's not for me. Now it's interesting because Martin is doubling down on true relict and graphically relict guitars. Uh, here's the D18 Street Legend, 2,400 bucks. This has what they call visual wear. So it looks beat up, but the top is actually perfectly smooth. So it's an optical illusion. There's also a D28 Street Legend for 2,800 bucks. Same optical relicking. Now, to me, this visual only wear feels weirdly inauthentic and it doesn't make a lot of sense, you know, but to each his own. Now, I really like the D28E Modern Deluxe for 4,800 and I loved the Double O 1228 Modern Deluxe. It's a smaller body parlor guitar, 4,400 bucks. The Double O actually had deeper bass than the D28. But, you know, neither were quite up to Holy Grail status, so I moved on from the Martin booth. Now, what brands competed with or surpassed Martin? You ever heard of Kepma? This brand is new to me, but apparently in the past 10 years, it's become the number one guitar brand in all of China. Now, they do a high-tech CNC build, and then they do over 300 hours of vibrational aging on every guitar it really does seem to make a difference because their guitars sound great, especially amplified. So they have this proprietary Ketma pickup system and I think it's really ideal for players who do a combination of finger style, you know, fretboard tapping and percussive hitting. So at the Ketma booth, we were lucky to see Casper Esmond demoing a Ketma. Check it out. are impressive guitars and they range from a low of just 225 bucks to a high end that's still under 2500. I think their quality control competes with Chinese built Yamahas at similar price points. Now when I think of legendary American guitar brands I always have to remember Guild. They have an F40. I think it's an underrated contender because it goes for between 1800 and 3000 you know and that depends on the specs and where it's built and then they have a lower cost d140 sounds surprisingly good for about 800 bucks okay let's move on to boutique luthiers cole clark from melbourne australia this is a unique company with everything built locally to them all their wood is slow roasted and then they use cnc machines and they pleck everything for perfection uh, they use a 300-year-old through-neck design, kind of like historic Spanish guitars. And when you consider all that, the prices are actually very reasonable. They're usually in the 1500 to 2500 range. So this year's Cole Clark innovation is something called a true hybrid acoustic and electric guitar. It actually has dual output jacks. There's one that has pure acoustic tone, and then the other has true electric tone. So it's an incredibly versatile guitar. Those hybrid models are going to cost about 2500 bucks when they're available in the US. I gotta say, I was impressed. I may want one for live gigging. All right, back to Bourgeois Guitars from Maine. They are always among the very best sounding to my ear. But as I said, the prices have really gone up and the two I love this year were 9,600 bucks and 10,500 bucks respectively. So that is definitely beyond my personal holy grail pricing. All right, have you heard of Iris Guitars from Vermont? 
They are definitely worth a play. They're highly resonant. They're, there's somewhat of a bargain in the world of boutique acoustics because they're in the $2,500 to $4,000 range. All right, then there's Bedell guitars from Oregon. Tom Bedell is what you could call an environmental luthier. He makes extremely high quality guitars using only found and sustainable woods, no clear cut trees. So Bedell gives you what they call a seed to song journal, explaining the provenance of the wood for every guitar they build. And then they include these excellent sounding K&K pickups, very wide price range. I mean, from about 2000 up to 10,000. Okay, Huss and Dalton from the Shenandoah Valley. These guys are consistently superb. Uh, you can find one used, maybe as low as 2,500, but most are up at the six to $10,000 price point. This year I met uh, Huss and Dalton's new owner, Brian Dickel. I gotta say he is proud as punch about what their shop is producing, and he should be. I mean, I played two Huss and Daltons that caught my eye. One was priced at 6,000, the other around eight, and they were fantastic. I mean, very tempting potential holy grails. I'm planning a trip to the East Coast this summer, and I'm actually gonna go visit the Huss and Dalton factory in the Shenandoah Valley. Kinda can't wait for that. Now, this final brand is out of pricing order because when I approached their booth, I could, I could literally see the craftsmanship and artistry, and I just assumed they were gonna be top dollar. They, they definitely look it. Hosen Guitars from Singapore. They're built by Hosen Yong. Now, Hosen was really the surprise of the show for me. Take a look at this Sitka Spruce Dreadnought. It totally wowed me when I play it because it felt and sounded equal to boutique guitars in that six to $10,000 range, but for the jaw-dropping price of 2,500. I mean, that's still not cheap, but it felt like a bargain for an absolutely stunning guitar. So Hosen also uses the Plex system, and then he specs only very thin finishes for maximum responsiveness of the wood, and he's obsessive about humidity. I mean, specifically, he measures equilibrium moisture content, or EMC, which is considering both the temperature and the relative humidity in optimizing the wood's vibration. All right, so those are some of the most important brands that you should play if you're looking for your own Holy Grail guitar. All right, I also promised to tell you the three most important things I learned at this NAMM show. Number one, you gotta play them all. Literally every acoustic guitar is unique. No company or luthier makes the same guitar twice, no matter how high tech or how high touch their process is. Number two, price does not determine quality, tone, or playability. In fact, it really reflects more the cost of the labor, the materials, and the marketing than it does the sound and playability. And number three, if you're buying a guitar to play it and not just collect, buy the specific guitar, not the name. It doesn't have to be a well-known name to be a great guitar. All right, I hope this was helpful and introduced you to some excellent guitar makers that maybe you didn't know. So everything I share on this channel and on guitardiscoveries.com is really just to inspire and guide you so you'll keep playing, you'll have more fun, hopefully discover something new every day. So your next video is right here.